All right, so today's topic is historical introduction to cryptology. So our aim is to see why we have ciphers like block ciphers and so on. So we want to understand what happened in the past so that we can see and we can understand the modern algorithm. So here's a brief outline. We will talk about some, first we will talk about terms. Then we will talk about historical ciphers. Then I will show you a, a good way to break all of them, frequency analysis. Then I will briefly mention Playfair cipher, which was used in World War I. Then I will talk about one-time pad, which is an unbreakable cipher. Then from pen and paper methods, we will move on to machines like Enigma, which is very famous. If you have watched any Second World War movie, you have seen them. And then I will briefly explain how British mathematician broke them during the war. So let's start with some terminology. So we hear the words cryptology, cryptography, and sometimes cryptanalysis. So let's see what they mean. Actually, it is not easy to define cryptology. We need a few paragraphs. But if you want a one sentence definition, the uh, easiest thing we can say is that cryptology is about secure communication in an insecure channel. So throughout this course, but throughout our lives, we assume that the communication channel is not secured. So everybody can listen to us, okay? So cryptology will allow us to communicate still using this communication channel, but in a secure way. So if this is cryptology is the this science, then what cryptography means? So cryptography is about designing secure crypto systems. And cryptanalysis is about analyzing or breaking these crypto systems. So in order to design something good, you have to know how to break them. So this goes hand in hand. So in the past, cryptology is used for the name of the science. Then it is divided into two as cryptography and cryptanalysis. Okay. But nowadays, these words cryptology and cryptography are used interchangeably. Okay. And especially if you're, uh, you know, working in this area, you prefer to use the word cryptography. Those people who learn this from outside or have less knowledge, let's say, they prefer to use cryptology. So you can use it as a distinguisher to see how much they know about cryptography. Okay. The same applies for Turkish, by the way. And also in the past, instead of crypto analysis, people use crypto analysis, but people no longer using it since 1990s. So also in Turkish, I prefer to use the word crypto analysis instead of, you know, with all. Okay. So cryptography solved a lot of problems. So in computer science or in digital world, we have a lot of problems. Like we want to have the privacy of stored data, messages, and conversations. We want integrity of stored data, messages, and conversations. So the first one is solved by encryption algorithms, as you can guess. So we can provide confidentiality easily. For the integrity, we have hash functions message authentication codes, et cetera. We also solve the problem of user and data authentication. Also, we solve the problem of transaction non-repudiation. So in digital signatures, this is what we have. So let me uh, start with uh, the word cipher and crypto system in order to see how we do encryption and so on. So crypto system or a cipher consists of two algorithms, encryption and decryption, okay? Plain text is what you want to protect. So your plain text can be an SMS message, can be a WhatsApp message, it can be a file on your computer, but it might be also your voice while you are calling your friends, okay? So plain text is the data you want to protect. <laughs> so a crypto system or a cipher is a pair of algorithms that convert plain text to cipher text and back. Cipher text, is the encrypted version of the plain text. So this is the one you send through the insecure channel. So we don't care if the enemy gets cipher text. We always assume that people gathered all of our cipher text, okay? But we want it to look like a random sequence so that they cannot have information from cipher text and go back to plain text. But we have encryption and decryption algorithms so we can go back and forth. This is the main idea. So cipher is actually these algorithms. In Turkish, it is used in a wrong way because in all of the applications, 
or a login page, they ask you to enter your cipher, but actually what they mean is to enter your password, okay? Not your cipher. So at some point, we hope TDK will solve this problem, but we will see, okay. Historical ciphers. So they are mostly pen and paper methods. Key and crypto system should be easy to use in practice. So I haven't mentioned, but here uh, we actually generally don't hide the algorithms, okay? Encryption and decryption algorithms in the standards are publicly available. So everything is transparent. So if the enemy knows everything, then you might ask why they cannot encrypt and decrypt it back. We simply use a small info that we call key, which is secret. So you use that key to encryption and also for decryption. So this is why uh, only you and the people you want to communicate can communicate, okay? So key and the crypto system should be easy to use in practice because you are going to use pen and paper. Of course, we are talking about times before the computers or machines. For this reason, they are mostly based on letter substitutions. Most of the time, empty spaces and punctuation marks are removed from the cipher text to avoid information leakage. So let's start with the basic and most famous example, scissor cipher. Every letter is replaced by a letter, some fixed number of positions, K down the alphabet or up the alphabet. It depends on how you define it. This is used in ancient Rome by Julius Caesar, who supposedly invented it. Okay, this is why we call it the scissor cipher. So let me give you a basic uh, example. Assume that my plain text is cybersecurity. Okay, I don't put any empty places or punctuation marks. So I choose K equals to two. So I write the alphabet and whenever see a letter, I actually replace it with two down the alphabet, okay? So this is also in a cyclic manner. So for instance, if you want to uh, encrypt B, you know, you go one down, it is A. If you want to go one down, you go to the end, the end of the alphabet and you replace it with Z. So as simple as that as you can see. So when the person receives the cipher text, they know that the secret key is two. So they increase the uh, letters in the alphabet by two. That is the idea. So in order to see why these algorithms are easy to break, let's give some notation. So we say that you know we represent plain text by P, cipher text C, and so on. But we are interested in actually key space. So how many different keys can you choose? So in this case, if you are using English alphabet, you have 26 letters. So K can be from one to 26, but if you choose 26, it goes back to itself. So actually you have 25 options, right? So this means that even if the attacker doesn't know which K you used, they actually capture the cipher text and try one by one. You know, they may assume that K is one, so increase this to B and so on. They check if the decipher text means makes any sense. Otherwise, they do it one by one and so on and so forth. So in 25 trials, you actually get the secret key. So it is very easy. So this is what we mean. So key space is 26, but actually 25, right? So the weakness is key is easy to guess. Key space is too small. One non plaintext cipher takes enough to break the crypto system. This means that if you capture this plaintext and cipher text, then everything is broken, right? We can easily guess the key and we can actually capture everything. So in modern ciphers, this is not the case. So the attacker might capture some plaintext and the corresponding cipher text, but from that information, it should still be very hard for them to capture the secret key or decrypt future cipher text and so on. All right. So you can make things more complicated since we said that key space is really small to one to five. So one can say that, okay, make it a little bit more complicated so the, the key space increases. So easiest thing you can do is to use a fine cipher. So in order to increase the key space, we use two numbers, A and B as the key and encrypt as follows. So whenever you have the letter P, so if you're using English alphabet, we represent them from zero to two and to five. So you multiply it with A, then you add B, but of course this number X is 26 most of the time. So you perform a modulo 26 operation, so the result is less than 26. And you look at the 
alphabet and see which letter is corresponding to this number. So here's a very basic example. I chose A equals to three and B equals to one. So it works like this. So, you know, A is zero, B is one and C is two. So here C is replaced with two here. You multiply it with three, add one, then find the you know, seventh letter in the alphabet and replace it and so on and so forth. So, so this way you actually increase the uh, key space. So one might say that, okay, I can choose A from 26 values, B also from 26 values. So actually we have a lot of options, right? But in reality, you don't have the choice of 676 secret keys. This is because although you perform the encryption like this, you have to perform the encryption like this. So here A to the power minus one, in other words, A inverse means the number which makes A when multiplied with A, the result becomes one modulo 26. So these are the inverses. So question now arises, does every number has an inverse in modulo 26, okay? You can see that if those numbers are even, actually you cannot have an inverse because you cannot multiply an even number with another number then obtain one modulo 26, right? Because it will be even at the end. So here's a little bit mathematics. A number can have an inverse if and only if greatest common divisor of A and that N equals to one. So in our example, N was 26. So in order for A and 26 to have a greatest common divisor one, as you can see, A cannot be even, but also it cannot be anything like 13 and so on, because 13 also divides 26. So th there are actually 12 possibilities for A. So that's the uh, greatest common divisor of N 26 is one. So there are actually less number of usable keys. So uh, here's an example. What happens if I choose a value which is not actually has a doesn't have an inverse as i mentioned a equals to two and greatest common divisor of two and 26 is not one but it is two so a doesn't have an inverse so let's use a number which doesn't have an inverse so if we look we will see that for instance e is mapped to j but r is also mapped to j so when you want to decrypt you wouldn't know which what letter j goes back to right this is why you need the number that has an inverse. So actually, this is not that important, but I really want to focus here. I mean, I didn't remove this from the slide because an encryption algorithm should be bijective, right? Once you're encrypting, it should be possible to go back. I still see academic papers where encryption works 98% of the time. So this means that every two out of 100 messages cannot be decrypted, right? Which is not acceptable, but we still receive academic papers like this, okay? Of course, as you can see, key is easy to guess, small key space. One known plain text cipher this text is enough to break the crypto system. So you can do this kind of stuff. You can make it more complicated. So. Uh, classic crypto systems can be categorized according to the message units that the plain text and cipher text are broken into. If you are replacing a single letter with another letter, as we have done so far, we call it a monograph. If you do it on pair of letters, it is digraph, trigraph, polygraph, and so on. Okay, so here are some examples as you can see. But as you can guess, it is very easy to break them. So for these examples I have shown you, are very easy to break. So we have to come up with a better algorithm. I mean, of course, when you are using pen and paper in the past. 